A huge settlement for a woman's death in a natural gas explosion. We'll look at how much of Excel's payout will come from your pocket. Republicans and Democrats find agreement on a way to find more innocent people who are currently in prison. A candidate for Denver mayor says the whole metro area needs to work together on homelessness. It shouldn't just be Denver's burden. We need to be working collectively across our county lines and across our city lines to address this. And we end the week the same way we have for 349 weeks now. We go somewhere random and ask our neighbors about what brings them joy in life. Tonight on Next. A jury has found XL partially responsible for an explosion that killed a woman in Aurora in 2018. We want to know if that means that XL customers are responsible for that $3 million verdict. It's XL's portion of the fault for the explosion at the Heather Gardens community when a Comcast cable project hit a gas line. Our Marshall Zellinger looks at who's going to pay for the verdict and XL's legal fees. Her legacy lives on. Her smile and laughter are what people most often talk about. Carol Ross, Derek's mom, was just about to check off her seventh and final continent. The last big trip on her, or in her bucket list, was Antarctica, and she was two and a half weeks away from departing on that cruise. A struck Excel gas line near her Heather Gardens home in Aurora led to an explosion that killed Carol in November 2018. It was disturbing that they didn't want to accept any responsibility for what happened. The gas line that was hit was Excel's, but the project was not. Heather Gardens contracted with Comcast to install fiber optic cable lines. Comcast hired a contractor to do excavation and drilling, which hired a subcontractor, which also hired a subcontractor. All were sued by Ross's family and a few other Heather Gardens residents. The lawsuit claimed the companies struck numerous utility lines, including gas lines, at least four times prior to the explosion. All the companies involved settled prior to a trial, except Excel. We ended up settling with these other defendants through a mediation process. They would not even come to the mediation. A Denver jury just found Excel's portion of responsibility to be a little more than $3 million. We emailed Excel this morning with specific questions. Did the company really not show up to mediation to avoid a trial and why? And if Excel has to pay any verdict, do Excel customers pay or Excel shareholders? The response we got was thoughts are with the families and that an investigation found the company did not commit any violations. Excel did not answer if customers end up paying the verdict. I would hope that the consumer watchdogs and people like yourself would not let them do that. I would love to know who it is actually pays for everything that we just went through. Uh, is it a rate increase that we have to absorb? that pays for the expensive attorneys they had fighting this case for them. I dread hearing about that. I replied to Excel letting them know that statement did not answer our questions and that we would be showing you our questions to them. The jury actually found all the companies responsible for almost $32 million in damages. But since those other companies already settled out of court, those portions are moot. Excel's is $3 million for multiple victims, not just the Ross family, but Kyle. Yeah. There are state limits on capping certain damages. So wrongful death, I found out today, the cap is $436,000. So the $3 million really probably isn't even up to $3 million. Mm. I wouldn't have even thought to ask about this before your recent reporting about how much gets passed through to Excel customers. Right. If I do a story like this more than a month ago, I'm looking at the verdict and how does this parse out and okay, so you're going to appeal this state decision, you want to try to get it higher than the caps, and now it's like, oh, you're just going to add that to our bills perhaps, let's find out if you're going to admit to that or if you're going to tell me explicitly no, uh, and I'm still waiting, I'm going to keep asking because if, until we get a no, you might assume otherwise. Yeah, this is kind of not the, not the kind of thing that Excel should necessarily blow off questions about. All right, Marshall, thank you. There is not a lot that Colorado's legislators all agree on, but this week the state legislature unanimously passed a bipartisan bill expanding access to DNA testing for people who might be wrongfully convicted. Colorado first passed a law allowing post-conviction DNA testing for incarcerated felons in 2003, but that law only makes DNA testing available for people who are currently incarcerated and only in conjunction with some other clear evidence that they're innocent. In the 20 years since, three people have been exonerated based on that standard. Legislators decided to update the law based on input from the Corey Wise Innocence Project and from people like Robert Dewey, who was exonerated from rape and murder charges after he had already spent 16 years in prison. I put in for it and I put in for it and I put in for it. And back then, the people that were running Grand Junction, they knew they messed up. And so they, wouldn't, they just kept denying me. 
He initially petitioned for DNA testing under the original statute, and he was denied testing under the statute. So it was really only through a unique set of circumstances that he was able to access DNA testing that ultimately did exonerate him and identify the actual perpetrator. And so Mr. Dewey's case to us really demonstrates the need for the change in the statute to reform it and decrease the barriers to accessing testing. The, the, new, the new bill lowers the standard of proof that people would need to access DNA testing, and it makes that testing accessible to felons on parole and registered sex offenders and people who have already served sentences for felony convictions. The unanimously passed bill now heads to Governor Polis for a signature. Our next conversation tonight features another of the 17 candidates for Denver mayor. Ian Thomas Tafoya's environmental activism led to Denver's Green Roof Initiative and Denver's Waste No More Initiative, where voters have required businesses and events to expand their recycling. Tafoya's version of cleaning up homeless encampments looks a little different. He created a group that provides trash and water service as they try to convince people to move into shelter. Your top priority, as you list them, is regional cooperation, and that is the least sexy-sounding top priority I've ever heard. How do you get Denverites to care about regional cooperation? Well, I think they already care about regional cooperation. We talk about our air problems, our transportation issues, our housing crisis, the homeless crisis. But how does the regional approach to homelessness differ from what we hear from some of the other candidates? Well, I mean, I think with everybody and the amount of public land that is available for us, whether it's safe outdoor sites, camping sites for cars in the short term, um, and then as we build up to taking over old commercial spaces and turning it into housing, if we think of it as a bigger system than just Denver and sharing that load of the 8,000 people across everyone, the solutions become much simpler, I think, and they become much more centered in the community. Somebody's going to say, I heard Ian Tafoya say he was going to take people experiencing homelessness in Denver and move them to insert town name here. Well, they're already doing that. I live on the edge of Denver and Lakewood. People are going back and forth and their rangers are saying, not on this side, not on that side. Even worse, in Adams County, where I've literally seen people living on the fence line of Suncor. That's unacceptable. These aren't good solutions. We have to find safe outdoor spaces for everyone. Seven candidates in the race, including most of the presumed frontrunners, have said that they will forcibly clear encampments. Tafoya says a one-on-one -on -one persuasion model works better. When our conversation continues in a moment, we'll discuss if he believes that people have a right to live on public streets if they want to. The second of our three debates in the race for Denver mayor is coming up on March 14th. Our goal is for voters to hear more from the candidates who have the best chance of making the two-person runoff. So, for the first time, let me outline for you how we have decided who's going to be invited. The polling company Survey USA is conducting a poll right now for Nine News, the Denver Gazette and Colorado Politics, and MSU Denver. We will be inviting the three highest polling candidates to debate. But we also want to include anyone who is close to making that two-person runoff. So we will also invite any candidates who are polling within the margin of error of second place. If you're within the margin of error of second place, you're in the debate, so long as you have at least 2% support. We have no limit on the number of candidates as long as they meet the criteria. You realize that's kind of complicated for debate criteria, but we gave this a lot of thought. And the goal is to include the candidates who have the best chance at nabbing one of those two runoff spots that you can hear from them, because only two out of the 17 will move on. That debate will be March 14th. Tonight's next question comes from a viewer named Jeff. He wants to know what happens to any unspent money if any of the 13 mayoral candidates receiving public funding drop out of the race or have leftover money at the end of the election cycle. Jeff, good question. The city's new public campaign financing tool, Fair Elections Fund, is designed to roll over between elections. So when candidates drop out or they lose, they have to return any leftover money they received from the Fair Elections Fund. That money remains to be used for future campaign cycles. You've asked us to focus the best we can on solutions for homelessness. Knowing how many of you want to actively contribute to helping people on the streets, our latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is supporting a nonprofit called Housed, Working, and Healthy. They do just that. So at the core, this is a job training and placement program to get people into kitchen and restaurant jobs. Housed, Working, and Healthy picks up participants from shelters where they stay overnight and brings them to their kitchen classroom for the coursework and also for mental health sessions. And they guide them into housing options while they're in this program with the hope that every graduate leaves there housed, working, and healthy. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me and a bunch of other folks in donating. Since Wednesday, you have raised almost $25,000 to expand this path from the streets to self-sufficiency. 
Denver is sweeping people from street corner to street corner. A half dozen mayoral candidates say, get tougher, start arresting people experiencing homelessness. One candidate says, you know, people will move if you talk to them, because he's done it. We all need to be interacting with these individuals to make them feel like they're part of the community. Ian Tafoya says the suburbs also need to help Denver solve homelessness. And we won't walk out the door on Friday night without first telling you something good. A bunch of things. That's next. Ian Tafoya would be the most progressive mayor in modern Denver history. Critics would say far left. Tafoya tends to focus on his on-the-ground work, which often inv involves collaboration with community leaders who really run the gamut from liberal to conservative. His outreach work also brings him face-to-face -face with unhoused Coloradans. And he said their perspectives aren't really reflected in policy debates. Do you hear disconnects from your actual conversations with people? Absolutely. If you, the, it comes down to what we've been saying in the debates, actually, which is if you want to ask somebody to move, you need to go talk to them. You need to build a relationship with them. Most people are pretty easy going once you start talking to them and you're like, hey, over on, uh, let's say, Stout and Broadway, you're in a bike lane. Yeah, you're right. We're in a bike lane. Can we get you to move off the bike lane? Absolutely. Do you want us to help you get this trash away? Certainly. Hey, we have the tools to do it, too. And what I noticed is there's a little bit of tough love in it. I know a lot of candidates are talking about tough love. When you tell people, hey, you can't live this way, we don't want you to live this way, you show up in an encampment, all of a sudden people pop up and they go, oh man, I've been waiting for some people to help us with this. I've been waiting for us to have some service finally. What happens when you offer services, you meet somebody with compassion, and they say, no, I'm going to stay right here? Because that's, that's where the candidates have started to diverge. Some people are saying, you, we absolutely will move people, as the Hancock administration says. Some others say, we will arrest people who refuse to move. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Well, what I can tell you is that we will move people by destroying their property is not making any sense to me. It sets people drastically back. It's not environmental to throw away good tents. We've been able to work with these people to salvage their tents when they're moving. It's like what I said in the debate. You've got to go back and talk to them again. It has to be a people-centered solution. There are only 8,000 of these individuals. We can spend the time to get the, the, the easiest people who are ready to move off the streets, and then we can concentrate the services on supporting these people and talking it through. That's an entire point of the STAR program, right, is that you can go down there, have a conversation with somebody who's in crisis, usually they move off of it. Being an educator, I know that. Do you think that people have the right to live on public streets if they want to? I don't think that system's working for everybody. I think we should come up with safe outdoor sites that people can go camp at. Look at the park system on BLM land. They have different rules about how you can camp. All the way up to our own Chief Hosa Park where you can go and you can get access. To, you can only camp a certain amount of days. You can access water, electricity, sanitation, and security through rangers. I think we can come up with a tiered system like that for the people who truly are not ready to come inside yet. My full 15-minute conversation with Ian Tafoya also touched on how the city might kind of push along Colorado's environmental goals, how he thinks that Denverites should be conserving water, and whether the city is truly ready for a progressive mayor. All of our candidate conversations are on the next YouTube channel, not 9news.com. Some grocery and convenience stores can start selling wine as soon as next week. Voters approved that in November over the objections of liquor store owners. A new study from Colorado State University says that those concerns might not be unfounded, especially for small liquor stores. To get an idea of the impact of wine being available in grocery stores, Colorado State researchers look back to 2019. That's when the state started letting grocery stores sell full-strength beer. Researchers tracked sales and cell phone data from 2019 to show that the liquor store traffic fell about 5% after that change. Researchers said that the popularity of craft beer did soften the blow for most of the liquor stores and small breweries. But researchers said that adding wine to the mix now in grocery stores would obviously benefit those big supermarket chains and force liquor stores to pivot more to specialty products to survive. The study also reviewed liquor store sales in other states, like Oklahoma and Kansas, which have recently put wine and beer in grocery stores. Researchers found in those states, it was rural liquor stores that suffered the most, losing as much as 9% in traffic each month. It's Friday night in the metro, on the move to the mountains. Things are looking good out there. No snowfall, nice dry roads. Things are looking good. And also, they're starting to look up. A little warmer, too, after we have been stuck in the deep freeze. 53 straight hours at or below zero wind chills here in the metro area. We finally broke out of that at 8 o'clock this morning. This afternoon, warming up 
quite nicely compared to the past couple of days, right? 39, 30s off to the eastern plains, 50 in Springfield with some 20s and 30s up in the mountains. Otherwise, mostly cloudy skies out there as we watch the storm system hammering parts of California. Heavy rain and incredible snowfall amounts out there. This system will push onshore and roll into Colorado on Sunday, delivering a couple of inches to the mountains. Tonight, Watching those overnight lows once again fall to the single digits in northern Colorado. 16 tonight here in Denver. Not a lot to look at tomorrow morning. Maybe a few quick flurries around Grand County and the Continental Divide. Otherwise, by about 5, 6 o'clock, we'll be monitoring some clouds here in the metro area. But that's going to be about it. Temps warming up. How about 55 will be in the 60s into far southeastern Colorado, 30s and 40s up in the mountains. Another warm, windy day for us on Sunday with our next chance of snow arriving next week. This week's good news puts our cold weather frustration into perspective. My good news is that I'm from Arizona and I got to see snow. A reminder that we've got a lot to smile about. Next. It's Friday. Time to ask people to set aside the headlines in the news and just tell us about what's good in their lives. This week, we caught up with a bunch of dancers in town competing at the Colorado Convention Center. It's a wonderful event. There's a lot of energy. A lot of good kids working hard, having a good time. My good news is that I'm with my dance team and I get to perform at a dance competition this weekend. My good news is yesterday I aced my social studies project and I got extra credit on it, so I'm really happy. Once the girls start performing, so much energy, so much energy cheering these young people on, it's a good thing. My good news is that I'm from Arizona and I got to see snow. My good news is I'm here with Kiona the Edge Queen, Dee the Best, all my dance friends, Lauren the Leggy, Livy the Slay Queen, and Miss Paige the Best. My name is Paige Hindley. My good news is that we all traveled here from Phoenix, Arizona, got here on time and safely. My good news is that I'm here and I get to watch my daughter dance. You get to like take the character as like what you're dressed up as, and you get to like act like out who you are. The good news for me is always coming out and watching all the hard work that they've put in over the last couple months, uh, whether they're working on solos or group dances and watching them putting on stage and uh, just being excited and proud of the, uh, the commitment that they've showed to their craft. My good news is to uh, come see my granddaughter perform and the other young uh, people with her and uh, just to be around good people. My good news is that yesterday I got to play in the snow. It's so amazing to be here. I don't know that I have the focus and endurance to be a dance parent. Coming up, your feedback on a mayoral candidate we haven't talked to. Next. Feedback includes a very good question from David, who writes in, will you be featuring any of the conservative candidates for mayor of Denver? Well, David, some might argue that Kelly Bruff and Kwame Spearman are among the most conservative candidates for mayor of Denver. But I, I'm guessing that you were in particular asking whether we will interview the one registered Republican in the race, Andy Rougeau. Yes. He is on our schedule to interview. All 17 of the candidates have, been, uh, have agreed to sit down for interviews, just rapid fire style, over the next three weeks before ballots drop. If there's topics that you would like to see us discuss, questions you think we're missing, next at 9news.com's email. See you next time.